Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Lynn Weil, the Director of External Affairs for CSET, the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown Inter University. Today, we'll discuss a proposal for a new export control regime among techno democracies to better address contemporary challenges. But first, a brief bit of housekeeping. All attendees' microphones are muted. If you're on a computer and experience any technical issues, use the chat function there at the bottom of your screen to alert us and a CSET team member will try to help you out. Please don't use the chat for anything else just yet. And now it's time to turn things over to my colleagues. Emily Weinstein is a research fellow at CSET focused on US national competitiveness in artificial intelligence and machine learning technology and US China technology competition. She is also a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub and the National Bureau of Asian Research. In her previous role at CSET, Emily conducted research on China's s and ecosystem, talent flows, and technology transfer issues. Emily has previously testified before the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission and the Wisconsin State Legislature's Senate Committee on Universities and Technical Colleges. She has written on topics related to research security and China's s and development in foreign policy, lawfare, Defense One, and other outlets. Kevin Wolf is a partner in the international trade group at Aiken Gump, a non-resident senior fellow at CSET, and former Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Export Administration. In his role as Assistant Secretary, he was the senior official overseeing the regulation of export controls and the intersection of technology and national security issues. He also served as the primary Commerce Department senior official responsible for working with the Interagency Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS. Prior to his tenure at the Department of Commerce, he was a partner with another large law firm and has otherwise been working export control and related issues for nearly 30 years. Kevin, Emily, over to you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Lynn. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, today, Kevin and I are going to be discussing um, our proposal for a new export control regime um, for the 21st century. Um, and give me just one moment and I will get us started. Alrighty. So today we're going to talk, be talking again, like I said, about multilateral export controls um, and a new way forward for the United States and our allies. Um, and this is particularly so I want to go back here so that the subtitle for this is how Russia's invasion has created an opportunity for techno democracy partnership um, on this multilateral regime and we're going to talk a little bit more about um, what has happened in the wake of Russia's invasion um, and how we can uh, cement some of the things that we have set up moving forward. So just quickly, um, again, we're going to start off with a broad overview of multilateral export controls, uh, what our export controls designed to do, and then we're going to go uh, into the uh, meat of our presentation here that's going to focus a lot more on thinking through this new multilateral export control regime, um, the near and long term challenges, both Russia um, in the near term as like the sense of urgency here, um, but the long term challenge being China and technology competition, and I want to emphasize at the outset here that we are not saying that Russia or China is more important or that one is more crucial than the other. These are just two different types of challenges that we're facing from two different countries. And I think we need to treat them as such, but try and create uh, solutions that will help us deal with both of them. So from there, we'll talk about creating a new regime. We'll go into some of the details on that, and then we'll move into Q&A. So to get us started, um, just more broadly, um, I think it's important to emphasize the fact that our current system uh, no longer meets today's more complex needs. Our export control system designed in the post-Cold War era um, is very narrowly focused. It was designed to be narrowly focused, but today's national security issues that can be addressed using these types of controls are more complex. And we therefore are, are then advocating for a new way of thinking about export controls. Not only is this a new way of thinking about export controls, but we need to be thinking about export controls multilaterally. History has shown with, with rare exceptions that unilateral or US only controls are eventually counterproductive and ineffective. So therefore our proposed solution here is the creation of this new multilateral regime of techno democracies and like-minded nations to address uh, the issues that cannot be addressed by these four regimes. 
So briefly, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin to give us a high level overview of export controls and what they do. Sure. Um, it all boils down to this one sentence. My entire 30 year career is on this page, uh, which is um, they're the rules that govern uh, three verbs, um, the export, re-export and transfer um, by either US or foreign persons that is from the US or from outside the US. Uh, generally four types of thingies, uh, physical items, commodities, uh, technology, which is information for the development, production or use of something software, and then in some cases services, the act of performing assistance to one of three things, the des a destination, uh, an end use, uh, uh, or an end user, a company or a person, and then to accomplish, because they're not an end of themselves, there are tools to accomplish a, um, a means, um, an, end, uh, an end, which is either a national security or a foreign policy objective. And so the key issue that we'll be getting into today is what now does national security and foreign policy mean um, in the current context? So, Emily. Yeah, well, here, uh, this is a, uh, a one-page chart. Once I was asked to draft out, put all export controls by a former secretary on one page. And I said, uh, sure. So I sketched this out and it's sort of the stuck. And really all export control policy making, in fact, all compliance with existing rules is really just going through and seeing whether your physical thingy, your information, your software, your service fits within one of these box in terms of a regulation, whether it's US or foreign defense trade or dual use uh, as requiring permission from the government in order to engage in one of those three verbs to export it from the US, re-export it from a third country or move it or share it within a third country. Yeah, and I'd say too, so I, I love this, this box example from Kevin. I think it, it goes to really show the how narrowly scoped our export control system is. Everything can literally fit within this box for better or for worse, but this is, this is the way it's built. Yeah, another way to think about it on the previous page about what it's not, it's not tariffs, it's not IP protection, uh, it's not inbound investment, it's not outbound investment. Uh, it's one tool in the larger toolkit of achieving national security and foreign policy objectives. Um, and so that's actually part of the thing that we'll be getting into, uh, you know, where can export controls be useful in achieving more traditional national or broader than traditional national security issues. But nonetheless, uh, this is a good chart for what export controls are. Yes, thank you. So just moving more broadly. So before we talk about uh, a new multilateral export control regime, it, it behooves us to mention the current ones that we have. Um, so this is just a quick overview of the four multilateral export control regimes. Um, that govern nuclear related items, chemical and biological weapon related items, missile items, and conventional, conventional military related items. Um, it's important to note too, that as we talk a lot about um, new uses of export controls, um, potentially in the context of human rights, there is not a single regime out there to identify items that can be used or, or misused to uh, commit human rights abuses, even though obviously these are very, human rights is very pertinent to, I would say, all four of these categories. So I, I want to throw that out at the outset just to make sure um, that we emphasize that too. So that is that is currently outside of the scope of multilateral export control regimes. Yeah, another way of thinking about this slide um, is uh, the, well, one sentence summary is that export the export control rules that uh, the U.S. and its close allies have um, are to identify and regulate weapons of mass destruction, conventional weapons, uh, and the bespoke or dual use commodity software and technology necessary for their development, production, or use. Um, and anything that doesn't really fit within that is generally outside the scope of the authority of the allies. The U.S. has yes. much broader unilateral authorities, but that's the relevance of this page. Yes. So, and again, we're going to talk a little bit about this. And, and for those who know, uh, Kevin and I recently published a journal article in uh, the World ECR, the Journal of Export Controls and Sanctions, that we called COCOM's Daughter. And no, we do not mean that COCOM. We don't mean combatant commander or combatant command. We are actually referring to the successor or, or to uh, the Coordinating Co Committee on Multilateral Export Controls. Uh, and Vasanar, which I mentioned is the, is the last thing on that previous slide, um, is the successor to COCOM. So Kevin, if you wanna just give a quick 30 second overview of COCOM. Uh, right, it was the largely the, um, uh, the East-West controls uh, that were in place throughout the Cold War and the relevance for cita citing it is that it allowed for much more coordination on licensing decisions among members and that its policy objectives 
were broader than just WMD or conventional military items. It had inherent, it had strategic characteristics and aspects as its objective. That's the relevance to wondering whether what we're suggesting is akin to COCOM's daughter that we'll be getting into. Yes, and we'll talk a little bit too about kind of the the parallels between this time period. So right at the end of the in the early 90s, the post-Cold War era and where we are now. Because there are some similarities, there are some differences, obviously. Um, but they're really uh, helpful lessons to learn in terms of setting export control policies moving forward. So again, just to reiterate what Kevin said on uh, COCOM, uh, this was a, uh, a multilateral regime that included controls, again, to achieve strategic objectives. It was This was East versus West. This was not uh, a broader kind of export control thing that's, that's just going to, I shouldn't have said broader. It was not an export control thing that was tied to specific items, just no matter what the strategic uh, context was. This again was very much tied to um, East versus West strategic trade objectives. Um, and I would also like to throw out too, and we'll come back to this point as well, but this also allowed for country specific controls, which the four regimes we have right now do not allow for. So moving on to that, and I, I, I've kind of segued us into the next point is that is, you know, why is a, is a new regime necessary? Um, and I'm going to laugh at this slide a little bit only because when I showed this to uh, one of my bosses here at, at CSET, Dr. Rita Kanayev, she looked at me and she said, Emily, this slide is kind of uh, chaotic. And I said, oh, yeah, no, that, that actually fits. That's kind of the point. Um, I think the problem now is that contemporary national security and foreign policy concerns are so much broader and so much more complex than they have been previously. Um, and I've thrown up just a bunch of different headlines from the last year and a half, some examples of Obviously, we have issues related to human rights where I've, we've put out like, you know, a hick vision camera, um, which most people know are, is, is being used to surveil citizens in Xinjiang in, in China. We've got issues associated with dual use research, um, supply chain resiliency and economic objectives, um, as well as obviously the elephant in the room, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So again, we, we have such a broad variety of concerns that have come up now. Um, and our, our system, like we said earlier, is not set up to address these problems. So we're going to talk a little bit more about these problems in depth, but I wanted to, again, frame this in terms of the chaotic and more complex world that we're living in now. So again, why now? The Russia factor is the biggest piece of this. Um, and I threw up a quote here from uh, Emily Kilcrease, who's over at uh, Center for a New American Security, because I think she I think she starts off this quote by saying this is a big deal. And what she's referring to is the very quick multilateral action that we saw come out, um, starting with the Department of Commerce here. Sorry, with the Department of uh, Commerce uh, here in the United States, um, issuing uh, very broad sweeping export controls using the foreign direct product rule. Um, and we now have actually seen Russia's invasion of Ukraine create a de new de facto regime. And I, I've noted here that as of this weekend, unless anything has changed in the past 24 hours, 37 countries have joined this de facto regime plus Taiwan. Um, and so this has already brought together um, a great group of countries to have these uh, starting conversations and, and think about this new regime. Um, and these uh, 37 countries have joined together to enact a common licensing policy. They've imposed uh, common controls on broad categories of dual use items and have done so in such a short order that again, like Emily said, this is, this is a big deal. Um, we also wanna note too that uh, you know, why now? Why do we need a new regime? Well, Russia's member, Russia is a member of three of the four regimes we've laid out previously and is actually the chair of the missile, missile technology control regime this year. Um, so Russia's membership in the three of these consensus-based regimes will make them less effective at addressing traditional objectives. Russia's membership will obviously be, be very disruptive moving forward. So we need to think more about um, not necessarily reinventing the wheel, but thinking of a new fifth category or fifth column to, to um, deal with these issues. So we've talked about Russia, which is the urgent kind of push for uh, creating this new regime. But the persistent challenge that's existed for, for a while now is the topic of controlling beyond traditional non-proliferation objectives. And this is something that has been in the works for years now. This is not something that is new in the context of, the, of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but that has definitely brought it, I would say, to the front of everyone's mind. Um, so again, Russia has created the opportunity some would argue that China is the primary target. I think we need to think about these again as, as, as two different pieces of the same puzzle. 
we need to you know deal with both of them simultaneously um but just more broadly tech competition will chi with china will present a different long-term challenge than the events that russia have sparked with recent developments in ukraine so we need to think about that i would say in, in that context and just again overall the contemporary national security issues are broader than non-proliferation um objectives so we're going to talk a little bit more about where we see this going forward so I kind of hinted at these back with that very chaotic slide earlier, but Kevin and I in, in our piece for uh, World ECR that you all will get, um, I think tomorrow uh, in the email, uh, following up from this event, uh, we've laid out four uh, new policy issues that have come up, I would say in the post-Cold War era, particularly in the last five to 10 years, um, that are not able to be captured under export controls as they stand now. These are new national security and foreign policy objectives. Um, and so they are things like responding to China's strategic technological dominance objectives. So thinking of things like made in China 2025 and China's push to uh, use economics to achieve national security ends. Um, this uh, involves allied supply chain resiliency objectives. So working with uh, key parts of the supply chain among allies to um, ensure that we have a better kind of feel of where, of where pieces of those supply chains are going. And we'll, we'll talk more about the, the topic of choke points later a bit as well. Um, again, I want to reiterate that there is nothing right now in the multilateral regimes or in domestic US uh, export control uh, jurisdiction that deals with the misuse of commercial technologies to abuse human rights. Um, and then lastly, too, China's military civil fusion strategy has made it so difficult to uh, identify or to differentiate between military or defense and commercial or civilian end users. So the military civil fusion piece, I think is really uh, distinct in the context of identifying end users. Um, but again, our, our system is not built to do that as quickly and as adeptly as we need to, to keep up with China. So uh, I, I think, so if we are thinking about why we need a new regime, these are just four of the, the issues that Kevin and I have thought of for this uh, new regime to start out with. These obviously are not the only issues and they are subject to change, um, but I think these are a good starting place and we'll talk a little bit more about them going forward. So I want to again, double down on the fact that multilateralism, although often slow and difficult, is the only way forward. Um, and I, I pulled up a quote here from the COCOM era from 1993 um, from a defense scholar from the Stimson Center that funny enough, I, I read this quote and it really you know, continued to resonate with me now in 2022. And it's this idea that the fundamental constraint on our ability in the US to control the export of sensitive military and dual use technologies is the availability of alternate, uh, alter, excuse me, alternative sources of supply. So this is, this quote I think really encapsulates why we need to tackle these issues multilaterally. We're in a now uh, integrated uh, globalized world um, and we need to tackle these issues with uh, allies, not only just to, to stay friendly with allies, but to ensure that we are actually closing all of the gaps we need to close if we are using export controls. Um, I also think it's important to, to think about multilateralism in the context of getting allies in at the ground level. This shouldn't be something where the US leads and then uh, allies will follow. I think we really need to get everyone in at the ground floor, have the conversations, um, and we'll talk more about why that's important coming up. So I'm gonna pass it to Kevin just to talk a little bit, a bit, uh, a little bit more about what our proposal for a new regime might look like. Uh, sure. Um, and uh, the key word, by the way, on the previous slide was effective. Uh, uh, you know, there are situations where the U.S. has imposed controls, and in the short term, they can be really quite effective, if, even if unilateral. But over the medium and the long term, then the supplies come from outside the U.S. And also, but for human rights issues, there are a significant number of unilateral uh, human rights related controls that we can discuss later. Um, so um, to um, to implement the idea, and I don't know, by the way, what the government is already doing. I mean, there are a variety of really excellent multilateral fora going on with the uh, EU-US Trade and Technology Council. There are meetings now going on in Asia. Uh, of course, there's the Quad Group about to happen, uh, the Indo-Pacific Forum. And so there's pro there probably is a lot of activity that I'm, I'm not aware of. But there's no one existing group that would really satisfy the group of countries of techno-democracies to address the for non-traditional national security and foreign policy issues that Emily described before. Um, this will be a difficult exercise, um, but the mold has been broken by the use of non-traditional controls over items that are not within the scope of the regimes to have country-specific controls against Russia by the allies. 
So I think the first step would be to get them to acknowledge in a common document what they have done, the, 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 the group that's willing to do it. Um, uh, uh, and you know, basically create a charter along the lines of what was described in the early days of Vasanar or in the TTC uh, uh, Export Control Working Group where they identified non-traditional objectives uh, for export controls. And the key, and it could start off small and grow over time as all of the regimes have done, uh, but the easiest would be to acknowledge what they've successfully have already done as a de facto turn it into an actual organization of some sort in a city. Hopefully that's easier to spell for most than Boston are. Um, and in order to show proof that there's something effective that comes out of it, I think my, my sense is that the easiest first step would be the harmonization of the military inducing and user controls uh, that various countries have. There are in a wide variety of written and unwritten states and are different ways in which their arms embargoes are implemented. And uh, so there's a great deal of harmony of policy objective, but not in terms of implementation. Um, and my sense is in terms of something with the smaller group to start with, that's relatively easy for controls that are outside the scope of the regimes, um, that would be an easy um, uh, uh, first step. Next. Yeah, and Kevin, can I ask you a no. quick question too, to just follow up on that? Um, I, I'm wondering too, so obviously there, there are, are certain things that the U.S. would have to do domestically to start thinking about creating this new regime. Can you talk briefly just about the, the intersection of ECRA, the 2018 Export Control Reform Act, and, and yeah. creating a new regime? So the um, exactly that, the authority for the current commerce system, so I'm not talking about defense trade, for which um, is a whole different structure. Uh, the statutory authority is the Export Control Reform Act, and it contains extraordinarily broad jurisdiction for BIS, the Bureau of Industry and Security and Commerce, to implement the objectives of the, uh, of the act. Um, it doesn't require the creation of a new regime, but it doesn't prohibit it. And it contains, again, authority for commerce to do whatever it needs to implement the objectives. And the, the statute makes clear that multilateral controls are by far preferred. Unilateral controls, although authorized, are not preferred for the reasons that we mentioned earlier. So it wasn't just us saying that, by the way, it was the US Congress in a bipartisan way in 2018. Um, um, and, and in the statement of policy at the beginning of ECRA, it explicitly calls out uh, the need to consider controls on items that are of importance to national security objectives that are not within the scope of the traditional regimes. So as a policy mandate, identifying things that are of national security concern, although undefined in the statute, uh, that aren't unique to or tied to the non-proliferation or conventional military objectives of the four regimes is clearly a policy objective. And so, so ECRA gives the authority to do everything that we're describing, but without the need for legislation and without the need for a treaty. Um, and uh, so it's a function of will of the administration uh, to do so. The allies, however, uh, will don't, generally don't have the same degree of authority to impose controls outside the regimes. The Russia controls have broken the mold. And so that's what we're saying here is take uh, the opportunity that the allies have created by imposing non-regime based controls outside the scope of the regimes to address these non-traditional issues. So that's the ECRA and then the counterparts in the in the allied country rules uh, comment. Yeah, no, thank you. That, so I just pretty much what I what I, I asked this question because I think it's a really important way to say that this is not a brand new topic. This is something that has been uh, kind of in the background in the shadows of some of the export control discussions for years. Um, so I think we're now just seeing it push forward thanks to what we've been seeing, I think, in, with Russia in Ukraine. So just to talk a little bit about what would be important for this regime to do, I think as a first step, and this goes back to, I think, uh, one of Kevin's, uh, Kevin's uh, steps there that he laid out, um, is talking about, uh, so where do you go from here? Where do we start? And the first place could be to identify those commodity software technologies and uses and end users that both warrant control to uh, address these shared national security and human rights issues or foreign policy issues that are outside of the scope of the four current regimes. So this could involve bringing everyone together to have these conversations um, and start to think about uh, where to go from here. Um, and I want to throw these out too, because I, I think we, this came up a little bit in the context of the uh, Russia export controls. Um, but I think one of the big pieces of this too is to get everyone, and I, I'm talking about US and allies, 
to get everyone's export control system at the same level, bring everyone up to the 21st century here. Um, so this could involve uh, improved and modernized domestic export control authorities, making sure that those authorities are better resourced and ensuring that all of the different players across a domestic export control system, for instance, in you know, the EU and in the UK and in Japan, South Korea, any of these countries, ensuring that all of the uh, relevant players are working together. Um, we put this as prerequisites for participation in this new regime, but I, I think this is something that as long as uh, allies and partners have said that they are committed to doing this by, you know, a certain time or committed to doing this relatively quickly, um, I think we can we can see uh, these being really effective. Um, and we've, like I said, again, we've seen something similar in the context of what happened with Russia. But one of the other big things, and we'll talk a little bit about the benefits of, of participating in this regime, but part of this, again, is just to ensure that everyone is up to par so that we can control, it, it, it's, it's almost like the content, it, it, it's almost like interoperability. We're thinking about not everyone has to be the same, but everyone has to work uh, with each other. So that that's kind of how we're viewing each other's systems. Um, so, you know, why should allies get on board? Uh, these are obviously just two issues that I, I think Evan and I could go off and list a whole bunch of why allies should get on board. It's, it's you know, just from, from the pure moral argument, it's, it's, a right, it's the right thing to do. Um, but the challenges in the new uh, geopolitical environment that we're sitting in right now are not solely shared by the US. This is not the US versus the world or the world versus the US. Everyone is, is relevant in, the, in the, all of these issues. Um, so I think we, you know, it, it just from that sense, this is uh, a shared responsibility. Um, but to what we have on the slide here, I think one of the big kind of benefits to participating in this would be that all of the members of this uh, new regime could work together to reduce unnecessary or unintended friction on beneficial trade that have been caused by domestic implementation of multilateral controls. So we can have a conversation and say, look, I'm the US, uh, Japan, when you did that, that hurt um, our at, you know, X sector in the US or you know, and, and vice versa. We can have those conversations and try and uh, figure out where things went wrong or where things uh, kind of veered off in a way that weren't expected. Um, we could also uh, see in the US, uh, we, the US government could consider ensuring that most US extraterritorial controls would not apply to countries participating in this regime. And Kevin, could you quickly give a, a rundown of, of how this shaped out uh, with the Russia and Belarus export controls? Yeah, a rather clever aspect of the February 24th, and early March controls that the Commerce Department imposed is that it extended extraterritorial jurisdiction over foreign made items that were otherwise not within the scope of, of controls uh, if they were produced or developed with US tools or US software. Um, and, and this asserted US control over foreign made items all over the planet destined to Russia of a certain type. Uh, but those rules, which can sometimes uh, great with allies in that they're asserting US law over the laws of foreign made items outside the US without US content or US persons, did not apply if the country decided agreed to impose the same controls on items for export from their country, which by definition makes the controls more effective because you have more countries involved, more enforcement authorities involved, more visibility involved, and um, uh, it, it allows for the allies to work better together. So that very clever idea from the February controls could be, for example, a guiding principle of, of the new regime going forward. Yeah, I think that's a super important point. Um, and it, it's another kind of carrot that we can extend to allies and partners to get everyone uh, to jump on board with this. Um, but besides allies, I think it's also important to talk about why industry should get on board. And but I, I don't mean just domestic industry in the United States. I think most people on this call would agree that uh, most companies uh, in this day and age have some amount of a transnational footprint. Um, so we're talking about uh, industry around the world. Um, the biggest piece of this, I think, is that new controls to address new threats are in inevitable. So we see with the U US EU TTC, we see with uh, uh, President Biden's conversations in South Korea, uh, where he's, uh, where, or I'm sorry, in, in South Korea, Japan recently, um, that new controls are, are coming. Um, so it behooves industry to get on board to ensure that they can help to channel these efforts on, on behalf of the federal government um, in a productive way. So, for instance, uh, industry could, should be getting involved in order to help level, or I'm sorry, in order to ensure that the controls are drafted clearly. Um, this is super important. Obviously, companies are going to be at the, at the forefront of uh, trying to comply with these new controls. So it, it, it's helpful, obviously, to have them at the, at the ground floor so you can have a conversation with them and say, does this make sense? Does this work? Does this not? 
Um, I, I think that's a really important piece of this. And more broadly too, getting industry to talk about this um, I think opens up new opportunities in allied countries markets. So we can talk, um, and this is more about, I would say, creating a new regime in general. Not only is it going to uh, help to level the regulatory playing field with competitors, it's also, again, going to open up these conversations like we've, we're seeing in the US EU TTC, um, where we're trying to find new roads to investment in different countries, um, particularly as we're trying to, uh, you know, onshore, reshore, change up supply chains, ensuring that we are investing in productive uh, places. And I, I think um, uh, Secretary Raimondo recently talked about, or, or maybe I think at the first TTC meeting, talked about um, investing or, or moving supply chains into places where there are trusted partners, um, something along those lines. So, so thinking about um, getting industry on board to help navigate that process. Um, and just lastly, too, uh, this type of multilateral regime reduces pressure on the U.S. government to impose unilateral controls. When we don't feel like we are in control, we are going to try and control it most likely unilaterally. And as we've discussed before, the unilateral uh, route is uh, potentially uh, effective in, in the short term, but not in the long term, and usually ends up hurting industry more. Um, so uh, having industry get into the, or be, a, be a part of these conversations, be part of um, the discussions, similar to what BIS currently does with technical advisory committees, for instance, um, that bring in scientists or, or technologists to inform uh, uh, the types of controls we use, um, I think it is, is super valuable. So before we close out too, I think it's just uh, really important for us to take a step back to, and uh, Kevin and I, when we were starting our report, uh, try to think about, you know, what, what do we want to do with this paper? What is the purpose of it? Where are we going from here? Um, so our objective here is really to fa facilitate the uh, both a public and I would say multilateral discussion of some of these following questions. And, I, and in our article, we actually list out a, a, a bunch more questions that I think we're trying to use to inspire other folks, potentially folks on this call, to uh, join in the research, talk about these issues, um, so we can uh, find a productive way forward. For instance, um, just a few of them off, off the top of uh, our heads that I think are really important are talking about when do we need to control, when do commercial or civil technologies or items cross over into that point where they need to be deemed uh, or where they need to be controlled for national security as opposed to being controlled as a protectionist tool. So I think striking that balance is something really difficult and I think we need to, um, and we in the United States and elsewhere have to have a broader conversation about how to do that. Um, is similarly, and I'll preview the, um, some CSET research that's coming out in the next month or so on uh, Chinese choke point technology or, or choke points in China's uh, supply chains. Um, but before we go about targeting uh, choke points, um, both in, in the Russian supply chain, Chinese supply chain, you name it, um, I think it's important to have a broader conversation about what are the tools and resources we use for identifying these choke points. How do we go about finding the data? Who do we talk to? Where are the uh, who are the relevant allies and partners for us to talk to? In, uh, for instance, the chip supply chain, there's a very uh, obviously a set group of countries we would want to talk to in that context. But in the context of robotics or in the context of biotech or pharmaceuticals, we might want to talk to different people. So identifying those different kind of buckets of folks that we need to talk to to think more broadly about those supply chains. Um, and lastly, I think this is a super important conversation right now, but thinking about how to use end use and end user controls when controls on specific items do not work. So for instance, in the context, uh, there, there are two kind of examples here. One would be um, an instance where a technology uh, is, is not available or a technology is not produced in the United States. So if we try and control an item, it, it's gonna do nothing. It's produced by allies, it's produced by other countries. That, that's kind of one key piece. But also thinking about things where if an item is a is a commercial or civil item that has very uh, important uses in the commercial sector, do we then need to think about how to control based on end use or end user or, or so on and so forth? So these are just a few of the of the questions that Kevin and I will be looking into over the next few months here at CSET. Um, but we hope that others will join in this because this is a a very large issue and obviously we can't do it ourselves. Um, I know that there are plenty of folks who are doing some great work on this too, but um, hoping to inspire others as well. So to wrap up quickly, just some con concluding thoughts. Um, so obviously we, we, we've laid out this idea of creating a new regime and it sounds great on paper, obviously, but creating this type of new regime with consensus around tech primacy and you know the elephant in the room kind of China will not be easy, but as Kevin and I argue in our paper, it, it, it is the least bad alternative. There, there's not really a way forward 
otherwise besides acting unilaterally. And we've already laid out why that's not as effective. Um, and again, I've previewed that second bullet there again, that these new controls must happen in multilateral fora. Um, we need to get allies on board. We don't want to push allies away. We want them to help us with this. We want them to um, be active participants in this new regime. Um, and lastly, just we want to also say that industry should not fear these efforts. Governments, both in the United States and elsewhere, will need industry advice, particularly um, uh, very advanced technological advice, as well as advice from folks um, like some of us who sit here in kind of the policy adjacent community in the think tank world or in academia. Um, and we can work to make sure that industry um, and other, you know, other stakeholders uh, can work to ensure that the controls don't cause unnecessary harm. And, and the last question I want to leave everyone with that I think, you know, Kevin ha has harped on this plenty of times. I think it's such an important question. Um, it's this idea of how do we define national security or, you know, it, it, uh, for lack of a better term, and I know this is a leading question here, but do we need to redefine national security? Have we gotten to the point where economic security is national security? How do we go about having that type of debate? Um, these are just uh, some, some really important questions that I think we need to sit down and answer. I, I don't have a good answer to them right now. Um, I don't think anyone does, but it's something that as we're going about reshaping both multilateral export controls and export controls domestically in the United States, this question should always be the question that we go back to. Does this fit within our definition of national security? So I'll pass it to Kevin for some concluding thoughts as well, and then, and then we'll open it up for questions. So just over to you, Kevin. No, that was a really great uh, summary throughout. Uh, we've got a lot of questions already. I'm happy to go straight to them because they'll be germane. Um, should we do that? Perfect. Okay. So yes, so just a quick uh, housekeeping rule, uh, housekeeping note here. Um, questions, uh, please put your questions in the chat. We don't have the Q&A function that doesn't work for us. So uh, we will put your questions in the chat and we will go ahead and, and pick and read them. Um, we also, so unfortunately, we also can't have people asking the questions themselves. So Kevin and I will go through and take a look at some of these um, and answer them. Yep. Um, and we wanna just also apologize to anyone who has joined us on the phone. We, we very much value your questions and we're, we're sorry that we don't have a way for you to uh, chime in, but feel free to uh, follow up with us after this webinar. Yep. Um, this won't be the last time we speak. In fact, that's actually the whole point of this exercise when you see the article is wanting to generate discussion among think tanks and others about answer, how to answer the questions that we put out in the construct given. Do you want me to answer the first one there? Because I think it's a fundamental question to make clear. I was just going to ask you, yeah, let's, okay, do, let's there do that. Go. All right, so um, it's um, how do we propose to lock in our step that, that I described getting the allies on board when you still have the Vosnar arrangement that participating states are still in? Um, and the answer is uh, we are absolutely not advocating for a reduction of commitment to the four plus existing regimes. Uh, they are still critical to the structure of the laws of both the members and the adherents around the world for their existing day-to-day -day normal non-proliferation and conventional weapons um, uh, control efforts and, and the dual use items necessary for the development, production, or use. Uh, we're, we're not saying that they uh, should be abandoned, um, rather we're saying that they will be less effective over time and that their mandates, their scopes, what they can do, what their authorization, what their founding documents say they can do, don't cover non-traditional contemporary national security issues. So, um, uh, and it'll be a smaller group uh, because with Boston are as large as it is at 43 with Russia and some of its allies as members uh, and every decision requiring consensus um, uh, progress will be difficult in some of the, the core areas. So keep doing what you can with the four, uh, uh, particularly in situations where Russia is really the importer of items as opposed to the exporter and, and think fresh with a smaller group of countries on these non-traditional issues and on traditional proliferation issues that for whatever reason, particularly involving Russia, can't be addressed in the four. The second question, are there internal clients in the USG reluctant to getting rid of the Vosnar agreement or any of the regimes? I think I answer that. We're not advocating that in any means, so no. Um, what is the realistic in terms of timeline for each of these steps? Um, we're advocating to move as quickly as possible, frankly. Uh, I mean, the allies led, and to extraordinary credit goes to the US Commerce Department and, and other agencies of pulling together what they did. Um, the, the, the whole point of moving uh, with our article now after the Russia invasion or rather the response to it is, you know, when I was there and before the allies have always said, oh, we couldn't do anything for any of these other reasons because our laws limit us to the scope of the four regimes. If it's not non-proliferation related, we can't do it. They can no longer say that. 
And, and so uh, given the urgency of the issues, the difficulty of getting alignment um, uh, moving quickly is really our suggestion because uh, over time, eventually the attention will fade and the organization will fade and all of the benefit of the relationships informal that have been created by and among between the export control agencies, the allies will fade. Uh, there's the risk of more uncertain or disparate types of controls cropping up. Inevitably, there will be in the short term a handful of plurilateral controls that have been informally announced by the administration. And we're not suggesting not to go forward with any of those, but rather to build upon um, uh, those as quickly as possible. Again, the legal authority is there and the allies have shown they can move quickly when they want to. And, it's a, and we, we've tried to lay out what we think is a persuasive and clear case that's in the joint interest of all the allied countries. Yeah, uh, I couldn't have said that any better. Um, uh, Kevin, I'm going to pivot for a second too and, and, and take uh, uh, a, a few questions that have come up on um, NSDD 189, which is uh, the national security directive that uh, came from the Reagan administration on defining uh, fundamental research for national security. So when does fundamental research um, need to become controlled for national security objectives? Um, so there have been a few questions about this, including one that says, given China's activities in recent times and given the acceleration of supercomputer assisted research, for instance, is it time to revisit the National Academy's evaluation of university research? And the, the similar question too is just any comments on NSDD 189 and the new impact of a new, uh, or the impact of a new regime on international scientific collaboration. I think these are super important questions and I, I do have to give a shout out to, to um, Melissa Flagg uh, and Zachary Arnold, both who, well, Melissa formerly at CSET, Zach still at CSET, um, who have done some work looking at research security at CSET that I, I hope to continue in the next few months. But I do think uh, the conversations around fundamental research, and Kevin can talk a little bit about this from his time at BIS, um, they are shifting, particularly now in the context of, and I, I hate to bring up anything related to, to monkeys, because I know that's, that's like a scary thing now, but that slide that I had about um, the uh, monkey brain research that ended up being um, uh, kind of deemed as dual use and there were problems associated with Chinese military collaboration uh, with European universities on that subject. Um, there's a constant struggle uh, between uh, open science um, that is so necessary for innovation um, and the need to protect some of these things for national security reasons. Um, and I, I think while this regime, at least at not at the outset, would deal with issues related to um, uh, fundamental research or defining fundamental research, I think international science collaboration and dual use research should be a topic that we discuss too, particularly as some of this research goes and fits into those four categories that Kevin and I laid out, including things like China's military civil fusion strategy, um, uh, certain types of uh, the proliferation of, of certain types of technologies that can be used to abuse human rights. Um, C said, you know, we, we've done some really fascinating research um, using uh, CNKI, which is China's big academic uh, literature journal or compilation of journals, um, looking at uh, surveillance related uh, research or, or things like that. So I do think that these topics have to come up and we have to start thinking about, I think, inter or internationally, um, how to uh, view this type of scientific research moving forward, this type of fundamental research. I am not in favor of totally increasing controls or, or totally changing the, the definition of fundamental research as we have in the United States right now. Um, but I do think we need, um, I kind of laugh a little bit too, because fundamental research as, as, as written in, in, in um, NSDD 189 refers to the threat from the Western bloc as the biggest concern for dealing with or for, for needing to classify research. So there is some amount of it that I think needs to be updated just because the threat landscape has, has, has changed. Um, but again, I think to summarize here, the, the conversations about defining fundamental research should happen, I think, in the United States, because I think we're going to have a different definition. But the conversation is more broadly about protecting uh, research, protecting international uh, scientific collaboration need to happen internationally. Um, Kevin, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that as well. No, um, no I'm actually just reading through uh, this great answer. So nothing more to add. There are so many good questions in here that we're going to run out of time. And I hope we can either collect them or that you will email them. I have answers and comments on each, each one of which is lengthy. We want to continue this discussion going forward. So if we can either capture the chat somehow or ask everybody on the call to email to us uh, your questions and we'll work them in.
uh, because they're yes. really very thoughtful, very, very thoughtful questions. And I, I want to be able to get to them and schedule follow on calls to the extent. Very much so. I want to turn. I want to turn. Which one do you want to do next is a third question. Yeah, I'm going to turn to one uh, that asks, what sort of industrial policy, either U.S. specific or in conjunction with other participating techno democracies, will be necessary in order to make these export controls credible and effective? I think I'm going to throw one thing out quickly and then Kevin, I'll turn it to you. But yeah. on this, one of the things that CSET is really focusing on and, and my line of research in particular is making sure that the protect and defend side of U.S. national competitiveness happens in conjunction with running faster. Um, and the running faster point is, is the point that points to, it's the point that points to industrial policy. Um, so we have to start thinking about um, our own innovation system. We almost need to do kind of like an audit on our own innovation system, see what's working, what's not, um, figure out uh, where we need, it, it's almost like identifying choke points in our innovation system. I think there are so many different things that we can do to better understand how the US innovates. Um, that can help us compete more broadly moving forward. Um, and to, to, to just add quickly too, um, a lot of these defensive measures, you know, export controls included, um, will need to have some, some type of industrial policy run faster thing that comes in conjunction with them because they really are complementary to each other. So if you're going to put export controls on a certain type of technology from China, for instance, or from you know, any other country, it behooves us to then look at, dom at domestic industry, see are there any people working on this? If there are no, if there are no companies in the U.S. working on this, how do we fill the gap with allies or things like that? But there needs to, the two have to happen in tandem because otherwise we're just going to end up hurting ourselves more. Kevin, I don't know what you have on that as well. That's a good answer. So Kevin, I will give you the prerogative to pick the next question, and the I have. Oh, um, there's so many good ones. <laughs> All right, um, uh, just, I'll do some easy ones. Uh, what objections or challenges do you anticipate? Um, the uh, good short question. Um, uh, the, the, the objection is going to be from the allies. Our law doesn't permit this. If it's not within the scope of the four plus regimes, uh, then we don't have the legal authority to do it unless it's for a weapon of mass destruction, catch all related in juice or an arms embargo application or one of the very slender reads of human rights uh, controls that are out there such as surveillance technologies. And, and so the biggest objection is going to be an old way of thinking, I think. Uh, you know, I love my colleagues in the former, in the, in the export control agencies of the allied countries. A lot of them think in very traditional ways. Um, they think of export controls as exclusively a non-proliferation tool or one related to that related for conventional weapons. And the biggest objection is going to be in the minds of those who want to keep things that way. Some of it will just be because that's the way they've always done it. Others will be because it's going to cost economic pain. Um, uh, China is obviously a very large market, but what we're advocating is that the common national security interests of the group of countries that we have in mind uh, need to override that. That's actually sort of the purpose of export controls. And going back to the industrial policy question, even without industrial policy, what we're advocating is a benefit uh, to the companies, to the industries in those countries by reduced friction, reduced barriers to trade by and among and between the members. Uh, for export control practitioners, we can all identify all the various difficulties on trading and items that will always be approved by and among and between the plus allies. We tried to make substantial changes in this regard during the uh, Obama administration um, about reducing uh, burdens on trade by and among and between NATO plus allies. And this is really just an extended version of that that should make the idea uh, more attractive to overcome um, uh, those initial concerns. Um, so uh, I've got a good one here no. too that I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw out an answer too, and then I, I think you'll have plenty to say on it too, Kevin. Sure. But uh, talking about uh, this new type of multilateral regime, uh, would this new regime rely more on a new or updated control list or more on end use or end user controls or both? Um, and I think this is a fantastic question. It is, and yes, as Kevin just did, it, it's all of it. All of the um, I, yes, I think the, the one of the uh, conversations we're having, and Kevin and I are doing some work on this now, is trying to figure out when is it most, or when is uh, the control on the item most effective um, and you kind of using that as the starting point. Um, and from there, if the item is purely just for commercial use um, and has very important beneficial uses, then you move obviously to end use and end user controls. That, that's the same domestically. Um, but in the context of this new regime, I think it's again, because both of those things are, we're thinking about this in the context of what is outside of the current regimes. So the current regimes cannot, uh, do not have any amount of end user uh, like country specific controls, they also are outdated in terms of their control lists. So just to say, I think 
we're trying to use this new regime or we're advocating for this new regime to, to fill those gaps. Um, so I have, I have another question too, and, and I think, or Kevin, I'm sorry, you yeah, go ahead with that quick, one. Um, yes. So, I mean, the historical problem with uh, end use controls, uh, which existed or were created really in the early 90s as part of the FC initiative in a WMD context, is that we have an otherwise unlisted item to an unlisted end user. If you have knowledge, if it's for a bad end use, that creates a regulatory licensing obligation. Is the uncertainty go that goes with it because you basically have to deputize the exporter to know when a license would be required in a situation where the government from which you're exporting has not made a clear line. So it is hard, um, but it is also, again, the least bad alternative to widely regulated, widely available consumer items that are being misused, particularly in the human rights context. And, and they're also difficult, um, not only from an internal compliance perspective, but from a legal enforcement uh, perspective and that the Justice Department or prosecutors don't like it because the standards are fuzzy. So I'm acknowledging their limitations, um, but I also realize that it's the least bad alternative to an exclusively list-based control. And also the allies laws, but for the WMD related end use controls don't allow generally for end use controls. And so this new regime idea that we would have would really overtly explicitly call for and authorize in the domestic laws end use controls in addition to uh, list-based controls. Awesome, I have, I have a few questions that have come in uh, that are about the um, outbound investment conversation. I know it's a little um, outside of the scope of this current, uh, of our presentation, but I, I do think it's important to address, um, particularly as uh, one of the topics for the US EU TTC was uh, some amount of harmonizing uh, inbound investment restrictions. So uh, one of the questions that I've seen here is, um, well, actually most of the questions here are just kind of in general, what do we think of this? Um, is this mostly a response to the failure of the Commerce Department to implement ANCRA or just where do we see this going forward? So I'll let Kevin hit, hit on the question about uh, ECRA, but I do think, um, so as most people know at this point, there is there are a few calls from uh, Congress to create some type of uh, outbound CFIUS, reverse CFIUS, or some type of um, outbound investment screening program as it relates to China. Um, this is uh, coming out of a concern, at least in, in, the, uh, in the bill that has come out of Congress, um, this is coming out of a concern uh, around, around supply chains and supply chain resiliency, particularly related to PPE, pharmaceuticals, et cetera. Um, so there have been calls again on the Hill to, to think about this type of regime, like I said, um, in the context of um, supply chains, there are also conversations that are happening about doing some type of outbound investment pilot program or outbound investment notification regime as it relates to uh, money flowing to China um, in specific sectors that are relevant to national security. Um, I think as with the conversation we had uh, during our presentation, all of this needs to happen multilaterally. Um, and even if we can't get uh, countries up to, or get our allies and partners up to speed on uh, doing some type of uh, outbound investment reg uh, regime or, or screening program, because I think that that might be asking too much right now. Um, I think it, it's a way for us to start the conversation, uh, get folks on board, because again, I, I think, and, and I'll, I'll preview some CSET research that's coming out in the next few months where we're actually trying to put data behind uh, this conversation, where we're finding that, for instance, US outbound investment into Chinese AI companies is only about 14% of all of the investment that goes into Chinese AI companies. Most of it, about 75% of it, is coming from China domestically. So this, I think this is super important when we're thinking about how we go about doing outbound investment screening, how to target it. Um, and as it, it also, I think, informs the conversation about what we think we can actually get out of it. Because yeah, we can stop 14% of, of, of money going, 14% of the investment going into Chinese AI companies, but it's not gonna stunt their growth that much because 75% of that money is coming from domestic sources. So thinking about, um, they're kind of, kind of um, couching all of our, our pushes on outbound investment screening um, in the context of, of data, I think is something that CSET is working on now and we'll be doing more on that. Kevin, I, wa I, I wanna leave time for you to talk about it in the context of ECRA too, because I think this is a really important piece. On the outbound investment side, well, yes. export doesn't have, I mean, export controls don't have an investment element to it. Um, yes. And the, and the, 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 the bills now um, actually don't involve, unlike with FIRMA, uh, proposed controls over the transfer of technology. It's all about investment to address, well, what export controls cannot. 
Um, and we are not advocating in for or against uh, outbound investment in our paper, but we do articulate it as a specific question about how it could be used in conjunction with our export control suggestions to achieve the same non-traditional national security uh, objectives. Um, so I'll leave it at that We've, since we're so limited on time. Yes, and I will say, so I know uh, we're about four minutes to 5 p.m. We do have some time to keep going because we do have so many good questions. Um, and I, I thank you all for, for your active participation and sending all of these questions. Um, I do wish we had more time to answer all of them, but I think we've got time for about three or four more. Um, so one of them that I actually wanted to get to was uh, in the conversation about the TTC. So Kevin, I'm gonna actually address this to you. Yeah. So um, as we're seeing with the TTC, while there are desires to multilateralize and develop comprehensive and complementary processes and controls, there are legitimate concerns that opening these discussions to too many actors will limit their effectiveness. So do you have comments on, on kind of how we can address that? I know you, you hit on a little bit in the new no. regime about keeping it small, but curious to hear uh, your So thoughts. a couple of things. So in the TTC, uh, I wrote a paper on this uh, with another Emily uh, uh, that's published that lays out for the first time in history how the, a, a non-US country, or in this case, the EU, uh, articulated non-traditional objectives for export controls and what the limitations are, are in that. Um, but in terms of the number of countries and the types of technologies, it all goes back to those four non-traditional issues that we laid out as objectives that export controls should be designed to respond to. What controls should exist on how to respond to China or other countries' objectives to attain um, strategic economic advantage by artificial subsidies, et cetera? What is needed in terms of controls to address supply chain resiliency issues in critical technologies? What are the types of commercial technologies that are being um, misused and abused in the context of widespread um, um, uh, human rights abuses? And there's legislation on this, by the way, in the CHIPS Act um, uh, that addresses the point. Um, uh, what are the types of purely civil technologies that, although not dual use, not bespoke, not really incorporated into military items are nonetheless uh, important for the modernization of a, uh, a country's military under a broader civil military fusion policy. The countries that are willing to work with us and they have common concerns in those core technologies and are the ones that are willing to align their licensing policies and enforcement objectives um, uh, are, are, clearly, and that are, are clearly the opening numbers. So by definition, it's going to be a much smaller group uh, than the Vosnar, probably four, five, six uh, to begin with um, uh, and will grow over time as other countries start seeing the benefits of participating in terms of reduction in burden of trade, buying among and between those countries, you know, extraterritorial application, and frankly, also realizing um, that it is in their domestic national security and foreign policy interest to participate because by definition, more countries involved uh, will uh, be more effective. It requires evidence, it requires persuasion. Um, it won't happen on its own. And thus our goal with this call is to get um, uh, industry and others who agree with this as a good idea to start talking it up in the US and outside the United States, frankly, because it's going to require a lot of action by the counterpart governments uh, to change their rules, policies, and thinking as well, not just in the US. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree anymore with that. Um, and I think there are a couple questions too, and I'm gonna, I, I have some thoughts, but I'm gonna have you start on this one, Kevin, about how do you, uh, like what type of criteria are we using to determine which country can join hypothetically, or how would you propo propose selecting allies that could be a part of this? I think this fits with the conversation yeah, the, about the, well, the, main, the size. The, yeah, I mean, the obvious first start are clearly a, a legitimate techno-democracy that has similar values. That's the obvious link, but, and it's unfortunately it's not within just the TTC it's not just within the Quad. It's not just within the Indo-Pacific Forum. There are, these are all terrific multilateral organizations doing great work, but the issues cut across them depending upon the technology. So one, it would be the countries of the major producing nations of the types of otherwise commercial technologies that are not now controlled or controllable by the four regimes that fit within the scope of one of the four non-traditional reasons and are willing to change their laws, frankly, domestic laws, to enable controls that are country specific, that are end use based, that are end user based and control items that are outside the scope of the lists that are created by the four regimes. So that, that's, the, that's the metric, that's the standard um, for which countries uh, would be included in the initial group. Yeah, and I think it'd be super important, and I, I don't want to forget to to bring up Taiwan in this context. I think Taiwan is super important, not only in the semiconductor supply chain. Everyone likes to kind of look at Taiwan and just say Taiwan equals TSMC, 
yes, TSMC is a very important piece of this, but I think Taiwan is, is a great example of a techno democracy that we can be bringing into these conversations um, to uh, help to kind of push the, push this regime, I think, I think in a productive way forward. Um, so I think, yeah, so I'll do about, oh my goodness, there are so many good questions. Um, but let me turn to one actually that is asking about uh, give me one second. Let's talk about emerging technologies, actually, um, emerging foundational technologies. There's a question here that says emerging technologies, as they were laid out in ECRA, probably seemed uh, forward looking as far as Congress was concerned. But Congress isn't generally known for most up to date for being the most up to date in regards to cutting edge technology. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, is there any discussion about trying to actually address and control emerging technologies before they actually emerge? For example, 6, uh, 6G, implantable uh, uh, AR, human aug augmentation, things like that. Um, this is a fantastic question. Um, and I think it's super important, um, especially as people continue to turn to BIS and say, where's the list? Where's the list? What, what's happening with the list? I think, at least this is my personal opinion, but I, I I think it is going to be difficult to come up with some type of like concrete list of emerging and foundational technologies, maybe different on the foundational side. I, I almost kind of like split those two in my head. Um, but on the emerging technology point, I think you're right. It, it kind of inherently, if it's emerging, how do you go about identifying and controlling it? So I think one of the things that needs to be worked on, and I think this is one of the questions that Kevin and I put in our, our report as well, is thinking about um, identifying criteria. Or thinking of, you know, a, an emerging technology has to meet X number of Y criteria to uh, warrant being controlled. Um, I think there are conversations that we can have, um, and this is, I think, the point where you need to bring in folks from industry, from academia, elsewhere, to talk about these emerging technologies because um, they're the ones who who know what they're doing. Um, bring those bring those folks in, have the conversations with them, you know, at BIS through, like I mentioned, the tax, the technical advisory committees, other things like that. Um, but I think, honestly, bringing this up to the multilateral level and having a multilateral version of attack, I think would be fantastic. Um, obviously, like I said, science is so international. Uh, and, you know, if there's an expert in X type of science and technology field that is super emerging and super important, um, if the U.S. is not, uh, you know, the leader in that technology, it's super important then that we go and talk to the folks in whatever other country, be that, you know, Japan, uh, Honduras, uh, you know, Germany, any, anyone, talk to these folks who are, who are leading at the cutting edge so we can be um, as informed as we need to be in uh, being prepared for the emerging technologies. I think the best we can do in controlling emerging technologies is, involves having foresight into where these technologies could go. Um, and, and the people who, who have that knowledge are, are going to be the ones that are that are working in, in the labs on these types. Um, Kevin, I don't know if you had anything else to add on that. Um, the um, ECRA, which was debated in a very bipartisan, uh, very transparent way uh, as part of the FIRMA um, uh, legislation on inbound investment in 2017 and 18, um, set up a concept that uh, authorized, required the identification of items to be controlled for national security reasons um, uh, that weren't within the scope of the existing re regimes. So another way of what we're really doing is a much more in this paper that you'll see it's going to be distributed after this call in response to one of the questions is a much more detailed description of what we believe uh, uh, national security means outside the context of the regimes, which uh, Congress and the administration and the statute um, left uh, undefined. Um, it had some standards in the statute, which I think are still good, which is that if it is a widely available technology outside the scope of either the US or a small group of countries, then it's not a good candidate for unilateral control. Um, um, so that standard, I think, still uh, exists. But you know, there's always subsets of core technologies that either exist or are emerging or have been around for a while that are not widely available. And this is what we go to about what the choke points are. And in every area that you go through, whether it's you know biotech or electronics or aerospace or um, any of the other 15 topics that have been rattled off, I'm confident from my experience working in this sector that there's always some subset that is the critical choke point that can be regulated in order to achieve um, the objectives that we uh, rattled off earlier and that will be effective if more than the US is doing it alone. Um, I, you know, we should have a conference just to go through with all the people um, that asking yeah. these questions here. I feel bad that we're not answering all of them. Um, it's no, I, what do we do now in terms of our timing? 
Yes. Yeah, so I, I, I'm going to pick two more questions and then unfortunately we'll have to wrap up. Um, but yeah, there, there's so many good questions and, and feel free um, if people want to email myself or Kevin after we can go ahead and put our um, contact information in the chat um, for, for folks. Um, but there's a great question actually here that um, the, the, the author said this may go beyond your talk, but I actually think it's a great question. Um, that is, is very relevant. Um, it is, uh, how does one determine what is dual use given the interdependencies and in technology? Or how does one go about identifying and determining what is strategic? Um, this is such an important question. And I, I, I picked this out partly because I don't have a great answer to it, but I think it is something that as we're working with, with all the relevant stakeholders from civil society, academia, um, industry, everyone, we need to think about um, where different types of technologies fit within not only their own supply chain, but within the broader, I would say, supply chain of or, or set of use cases, if that makes sense. Um, and and the, the example that I'm thinking of here, and I think the way we would go about identifying or determining if something were dual use or strategic, uh, goes back, I think, to the point of defining national security, because you can't start thinking about what is strategic until you know what your strategic, what your strategy is. Um, so that's one kind of key point of it. And it brings me back to the idea that Kevin and I were talking about with this new regime not being for, you know, mercantilist or trade protectionist uh, uh, objectives. It, it's merely for national security and foreign policy objectives. Um, but that's a very difficult line to draw as well. So that's something that I think needs to be talked about in, in the question of, of strategic, um, or how do you identify when a technology is strategic. On the dual use case, um, I sometimes fall into the trap of thinking that almost everything is dual use. Um, I almost feel like because of the, uh, because of where we are, I would say, um, in technology supply chains and technology competition, things like that, you could make an argument that almost everything is dual use. It is then going about determining when that dual use technology crosses over into the point where it needs to be controlled for national security reasons. So I am less concerned about determining the, you know, whether or not something is dual use and more concerned about determining when it crosses that line. Because I would agree that in this day and age, because of the interdependencies and technologies and, and so many other reasons, you could, you could argue that anything is dual use. Kevin, did you have a question that you no, wanted yeah, to answer? I, I, one way of the way I think about dual use is the conventional, traditional way that's in the definition in Bosnar and the four regimes at the beginning of the EAR, which is if an item has inherent characteristics that make it uh, uh, usable for military or proliferation related applications as well as commercial. And I think one of the significant parts about what we're proposing is that controls would need to be imposed on purely civil items that don't have some inherent characteristic. Um, with respect to a WMD or a conventional military application, if, for example, it's the type of item that's used in a mass surveillance activity that's not otherwise controlled, or um, uh, uh, facial recognition or DNA tracking or some of the other um, uh, broader uh, uh, human rights issues uh, around the world, or if it's necessary to respond to a country's strategic economic dominance objectives of, of even for purely civil items to um, be able to regulate the flow from its country in a time of hostility, that which would bring down or harm the critical infrastructure of the US. And, and those are by definition items that aren't inherent, don't have inherent characteristics for WMB or military, but nonetheless, um, uh, their regulation is a, of a broader national security or in the human rights context, foreign policy objective. So that's how I see the two. And then strategic is a concept that goes to country specific because of country specific policies as opposed to the mindset of the four regimes, which are country agnostic, where you look to whether this thing in your hand could be abused for making or operating a missile or chemical or biological weapon, um, as opposed to a purely civil item that is being used by a country to achieve dominance over another country for economic reasons. And historically, economic reasons did not factor into export controls when making a decision about whether to list an item, um, it wasn't into, you know, can we do this as a tool of trade policy? That's just not how it worked. Um, and decisions about whether to approve or not uh, were not based upon um, the economic implications. If something was going to put the warfighter at a disadvantage um, or be at risk for diversion for a WMB application, you don't authorize the export, even though it would have significant economic harm. And, and so what makes this exercise that we're discussing here particularly difficult and why it hasn't been done before is how do you have controls to achieve you know, economic objectives that rise to a national security level 
that aren't just straight up trade protectionists to achieve economic gain for the sake of economic gain, which is what we're not yeah. advocating. It's about understanding where that threshold is. And where that and line it, is it drawn. Change. And you have to have standards and metrics and we're hoping to develop those uh, in order to yes. articulate what an appropriate control is to achieve that. And it's largely in response to what the other country covets uh, to achieve um, objectives that are you know, non-traditional economic objectives. Okay. Um, so um, anyway, that's it's fine. No, I think now. yes, I have one. So just to round out here, there is a question here about what our next steps are, and I think that's that's a great question yeah, to yeah. round things out with. Um, so, like we said, so uh, everyone who registered for this event will get a copy of the paper that Kevin and I wrote called Cocom's Daughter that lays out what we discussed here um, in depth. Um, but Kevin and I and others at CSET and others uh, throughout the think tank world in DC are also working on plenty of these issues. But I think Kevin and I are very interested in talking to folks in US government, talking to folks, folks in foreign governments, allied governments, uh, to kind of see where uh, others stand on some of these issues. Um, and we're also interested in talking to folks in academia, folks in industry, folks who um, are working at the cutting edge of these technologies and have questions about what the future of export controls might look like. I'm not saying that Kevin and I have the answer to that, but we we can speculate it as as uh, we can speculate as uh, we see fit. But um, I think from there, um, and I'm sorry, the the other last thing I'll, I'll preview too is there there's some CSET work in in uh, the pipeline, as I mentioned, on uh, uh, understanding China's choke point technologies. That's uh, being uh, written by Ben Murphy. Uh, from CSET, who is our translation manager. Um, that should be coming out soon, and I think that'll uh, do a lot to inform some of the conversations around export controls. Um, so more to come on that as well. Um, but with that, I think we will wrap it up here. Thank you all so much, and I'll pass it back to Lynn. Great. Thanks very much, Emily, and thank you as well to you, Kevin. Thanks, too, to everyone who joined us today. We really appreciate all your comments and questions, and we're sorry we couldn't get to them all. If you'd like to learn more about CSET, please go to cset.georgetown.edu and sign up for our newsletter and our research updates. Our next webinar will take place on June 23rd. It will feature CSET's Husan Chahal and Nord Luang, together with Martin Rasser of the Center for a New American Security. And they'll discuss artificial intelligence and the Quad countries, the focus of a paper that CSET just published today in time with the uh, Quad leaders meeting in Japan. So once again, we look forward to seeing you next time. In the meantime, we'll email tomorrow with Emily and Kevin's article in World ECR, as well as details on how you can find the video for today's event. Thanks for joining us. See you again real soon.